welcome. Sandra Good Douglas there. Thank, thank you so much. That's Sandra Douglas, the founder of the first Back to School Bank. Um, let's speak to Paul Stewart. Morning, Paul. Hi, good morning. How's it going? Not bad, thank you. Um, what's the reality of, of children who are struggling in Scotland? Um, well, I grew up in abject poverty and it does have lifelong consequences. Um, yeah, and I've, I've still got an eating disorder today because of my, my childhood, you know, and um, we didn't have much money. You know, there, was a, there wasn't as much access to, to borrowing and stuff like that when I was growing up in the 70s and uh, my parents were um, neglected towards me and my, my other sisters, my sister was there, and we had to get free school meals, and that was basically the only, that was only probably the decent meal we got of the day. Um, I remember eating sandwiches with just salt and vinegar on them, sandwiches with brown sauce on them. Um, I didn't know you could get porridge with sugar until I was about 12, and I got sent into hospital. Um, I only thought you could get sugar um, porridge with salt. It was like a luxury to have porridge with sugar in it. Um, and of course, when you get um, free school meals, of course, there was a stigma attached to that because obviously people knew yeah. um, you were on school meals and obviously that, got, that led to bullying circumstances as well and that led to, well, it led to me, I, used, I missed half my schooling because of it. I missed half of my high school education because of the, the bullying and so on. I had to suffer because I was living in poverty and, um, yeah, and I left school with no qualifications, of course, and that then... Reds on to you, you know, you can only get low paying jobs, you know, you have, you have to work a lot harder, you have to have things like prepayment meters for your energy costs, which you've been mentioned as well this morning. So, people that live in poverty, you have to pay the highest energy costs. You know, you're, if you've got a prepayment meter, you're paying a much higher cost than somebody who can afford to pay for that in advance, for example, who doesn't have to pay DOT in it. So, obviously, that's held by the, the powers that can change that as the UK government only. Um, obviously in Scotland the Scottish government are kind of limited by a fixed budget um, but poverty levels your listeners can be rest assured that it's even worse in England uh, I've lived in England as recently as 2017 and the poverty levels are 50 percent lower in Scotland because of the actions of the Scottish government so they're trying to do what they can do but with a limited um, fixed budget so in my opinion it's mostly down to the UK government they're responsible for the energy, you know, like BP and Shell and all that have not been paying tax for years, you know, um, up until fairly recently. So there is a lot more that could be done, but yeah. it has a life loss of life, life, lifelong lasting effects on you. I still, I've got an eating disorder today because of it. Yeah, and, 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 and that, we're going to speak to Andrea Chatton in just a second, who's a, who's a um, children's psychologist, and, and, and I want to look into that as well, about the longer lasting effects. But I'm thinking back to something you said there about whenever you get free school meals and I'm thinking back to when I was at primary school and you there were children in our class who had um, dinner tickets was what they were called at the time yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you knew you knew that there was that was, nothing nothing was spoken about or it wasn't you know it wasn't sort of discussed or whatever but you knew that that's the reason that they were having these dinner tickets there was almost like sort of an unsaid discussion or unsaid sort of knowledge that that you know, of, of what that represented. Do, do you remember at that time when you were growing up sort of knowing or thinking, I'm poor, and what that oh, meant? I, well, it was really a bit of that, like, you know, because, as you see, you got different coloured dinner tickets, you know, and everyone knew it. I went to a really rough school in Edinburgh called The Fort, then I went to Trinity Academy. They were both pretty, pretty rough schools at that point, and then, um, yeah, I did get bullied because of it. You know, and I remember an instance as well, you know, this was primary school, and I remember when, like, you know, after the summer holidays, you used to go in and then the teacher would do things like, oh, I'll draw a picture of where you went on holiday. And I'm like, what do you mean, man? I didn't go, I didn't go on holiday, but he didn't want to admit he didn't go on holiday. Yeah. No. So people were saying, oh, they were away, like, wherever. They were, some people were quite lucky enough to go abroad and stuff like that, even when I was growing up. But So I had to, I just lied and says I went to Blackpool. And then um, I, I remember, I, I, I couldn't, I, well, I didn't know what the Blackpool cover looked like. So I had to ask the teacher and Barry say, well, I can't remember what the Blackpool cover looks like. Now, if you'd been to Blackpool, you could not possibly forget what the Blackpool cover looks like, you know. So I think the schools could maybe be a bit more diplomatic in the type of questions that they ask and to try and remove the stigma attached to things like that. I know the Scottish Government have been trying to, um, you know, they're trying to bring in free school meals for everybody. And I've been at my local NSP for, for years about it. You know, saying that Luke, because Ben McPherson was the Social Security Minister for a while, he's my work for NSP. And, you know, I've, I've said to him, stressed to him on numerous occasions that you have to give every school children free school meals, primary and secondary. 
remove that stigma. Yeah. And plus, it's been proven in Finland as well, you can tr- control the diet. Finland's got a much lower obesity rate than Scotland has because, as we know, people who can't afford to eat proper diets, they tend to end up, tend to, tend to up nowadays quite obese. That wasn't the case when I was growing up. We never had obesity when I was growing up, but obviously today there's a lot more obese people going about. And again, a lot of it is linked to the, you know, to the parents using, having to use the cheapest of stuff, you know, like ready meals and whatever it is. But yeah, just, just having that access and that ability to make sure that, that people have the right nutrition, I think, is part of that. I'm, Paul, I'm interested to hear about your work with uh, Poverty Alliance and just, I suppose, we were hearing from Mary and from Anne earlier who work with Children's First about really what is happening. So, so it's we know or we might have had experiences of our own growing up. We might have had experiences of remembering people who we went to school with or things that were happening when we were we were younger. But what what is the reality that you're seeing with Poverty Alliance right now in, in Scotland in 2023? Um, yeah, well, what's it like? Well, I, am, well, I work with different organisations. In the last few years, I've worked with Social Bite, um, do stuff in the Poverty Alliance. I've done stuff in the Visible Cities, the Grass Market Project and all that. And uh, as it's the, there are, we're, luck, we're quite lucky in Scotland actually. There's quite a lot of places we've heard today. But there are quite a lot of places that are really helping people. Um, you know, we're doing the school uniforms. You know, you've got food banks. I, I put to use food banks. Last the fact, when was the last time I used a food bank? I think I used a food bank about probably about four years ago. That was the last time I had to use a food bank. I had my, my son was staying at the time he was fifteen, and we had to go to a food bank, right? But to be honest, the uh, what you got was was not very good at all, you know. Um, it was supposed to last you three days. It was like the cheapest of cheap products. And it was like really all processed food, you know, as well. So um, I know the food banks are doing what they can. That's but maybe, it. The reality is, I suppose, more nutritional, yeah. you know, foods on offer. But there are, there are organisations as well. You've got, in Leith, where I live, you've got em- empty kitchens, kind hearts. And they stepped up during the during the COVID campaign. You know, when they were feeding, they were feeding up to one thousand five hundred people a day at least. And now they're even after COVID, now they're still going. They've got a permanent base, so we're quite lucky that we've got lots of organisations that have stepped up to the plate in the last few years. But again, it's linked to the high energy costs. You know, people are scared to switch on their heating, and it is for the reality is people. You've heard it today. People are having to choose whether or not they want to heat their homes in the winter or buy food. Or, because it's quite, I, I said that when I first started volunteering with Social Buy, right, and who obviously was feeding homeless people at the at the homeless suppers, they were feeding people twice a day in the cafes in Edinburgh and Edinburgh in Glasgow and Aberdeen. And I said to them straight away when I started volunteering for the Social Buy to Josh and Jane, who was the CEO at the time, like, that's great that you're feeding the people who are coming to your shop, right? But what about the people who are too embarrassed to go to your shop? How do you reach them? Because I know. People who are too embarrassed, because you can imagine if you've had a, if you've worked for most of your life and then for whatever reason it could be domestic abuse, violence or whatever, you've ended up in a situation like your temporary homelessness, you're on a very low um, benefit rates, but you're too proud and too embarrassed to go to a, to a place like that. I would, I, just, I, just, I would just, just on that like point, though, just on that point, Paul, um, on the embarrassment front, right? This this text came in and said redirecting the money from giving free school meals to those who don't need it um, is actually part of it. There used to be a stigma attached to that, but payments are now done electronically, so no one knows who's actually paying. So I suppose it's it, it's like it's it's free. Likewise, travel if the children have free travel, but their parents don't. What's the actual point of it? Um, so keep keep your thoughts coming in. Eight zero two nine five is the that's best way the to. No, I, I think I think. No, I think I think what the children's fault, you know. Yeah, no, I think what that that text is trying to say is that if if you made sure that the right people are getting the free school meals, that's saving some money. And because it's now online, you, you don't necessarily have that stigma. It, stay, stay there a minute, actually, Paul, if you will, because I'd love to bring in um, our next guest, who is, um, she knows exactly what it's like. It's Andrea Chatton, uh, Children's Emotional and Behavioural Psychologist, um, who knows exactly what it's like, I would imagine, um, to have to speak to, to to have to deal with children who've who've struggled in this area. And Andrea, we were listening to Paul there who was saying that the effects of growing up in poverty still live with him, even to this day. 
Uh, morning. Uh, can I just thank Paul for his incredibly honest, reflective, lived experience of, of living in child poverty. I think that that probably was the most powerful thing that we'll all hear today. But w what he was saying does reflect what we find in research. Um, children who were growing up in poverty are seen to be five more, five times more likely to be fundamentally unhappy. And the, the, the other issue that is, it's not just about addressing the issues now to try and minimise the impact, but a lot of uh, mental illness, adult mental illness starts in childhood. And that, if we don't get this right for children now, those issues are going to be activated and they're more likely to carry across into the, ad into the life, uh, adult lifespan. What does that mean in terms of what can it mean developmentally for children, for children who grow up in a situation where, let's just take even the fundamentals of, of not having the right food, first of all. Well, it, it, even the basics of the physiologically, the, we, we tend to be as healthy as the food that we eat. And it's not just about physi physi physiologically in our body. That that also feeds our mind. If if we're not getting the right amount of nutrition and the broad span of nutrients that we need, it will affect us cognitively. And that means that when we go into the classroom, when young people are going into the classroom, they can't concentrate as much. They're not as focused. They're probably more tired. I mean, I, I've worked with, you know, and that's the children who are getting in. You know, Paul said that he had huge lapses of engaging in education. I've worked with children who have missed several sessions because we take the work that we do into schools because we need to be getting the mental health support to where children are. Um, and kids have said that, that, you know, that they might have missed a couple of sessions because they didn't have any shoes to come into school with. They didn't have, they didn't have any school uniform. Um, and, you know, and, and that's the other impact that these kids, the, the impact of living in poverty has impact on their self-esteem. Your self-esteem is what you think about yourself and what you think other people think about you. And children who are living in poverty are very aware that people are looking on at them and what they might be thinking about themselves and about them and what they're thinking about themselves. So, you know, these, these, these issues are really, really impactful. And again, stop children who are living in poverty accessing as much um, education, leaving with higher results. Um, that, you know, often children who are living in poverty have to go out to work earlier just to be able to bring some money in. But what we're, what we're, the main thing that we're forgetting about this, and I'm sure everybody who's listening today has had periods in their life when money has been a worry. We know how preoccupying that is. And children who are living in poverty, their parents are living in poverty. And obviously, the, they are preoccupied and consumed with this worry. And that passes down to the children because parenting has to go one way from parent to child. And if a child is living in a situation where their parents are stressed, feeling anxious, worried, scared, then it affects what they can get from that parent. So often children go through situations like this, traumatic situations. They go through it twice. One, experiencing it firsthand. And secondly, but they also lose their parents to a certain extent because the parents can't be occupied with emotional with... support, what yeah. the child needs. Um, stay with us, please, Andrea. This is such an interesting and, and insightful conversation. Stay with us if, if, if you can for a couple of minutes. Um, and we've still got Paul on the line as well. Um, just a couple of texts coming in. Hi, Corey. We, we're taking the wrong attitude towards poverty um, for children. Our country is obsessed by saying we're the best. We're not. We blew billions in vanity projects, headline projects and dreadful wastes of investment. Most will fail. Ferries, court cases here and there uh, and in London and we know we're losing them. Uh, David and Campus Lang, we need to encourage work and supply better health care and most importantly education. Uh, we're obsessed with giving everything away for free. It's not the answer. Um, 80295 send us your text send us your thoughts on this um, or you can give me a call 0885 92 95 00 it's 5 it is 9 54 to win two European trophies. When you believe it's possible, then anything can happen, and the dream came true. Join me, Tom English, in conversation with Willie Miller, 40 years on from Aberdeen's incredible European adventure. But now it's all Aberdeen here in Gothenburg. When you put all the personalities together, that's what made us the unit that we were. Willie talks about his time playing for and captaining the Dons. It was accepted that your manager came in and had a band. So I always took it to the extreme at times. And he reflects on Aberdeen's incredible story. That's the way you should lift a trophy. I want to make sure I've got the hair and the moustache and of course, into the photograph. A magic moment for this. This Sporting Life, listen now on BBC Sounds. You're listening to Mornings with me, Connie McLaughlin on BBC Radio Scotland. Coming up after 10...
Oh, I'm just loving it. Porthole window on a cul-de-sac. That was all I dreamed of as a kid. I wanted to live in a house like that. Ahead of the launch of Series 5 tonight, we hear from the woman who does live in a house like that about what it is like to feature on Scotland's Home of the Year. And... In the summertime, when the weather is hot, you can stretch right up Just in time for the sunshine, travel expert Simon Calder will be back to answer all of your travel-related questions. You can get them in by texting 80295. Get in touch with BBC Radio Scotland. You can call our free phone number on 08085 929500. Text 80295. Standard message rates apply. This is BBC Radio Scotland. This morning we are talking about the reality of living in poverty if you're a child in Scotland in 2023. What is it like? Uh, lots of you getting in touch. This text says, all for government support for disadvantaged kids, but the majority uh, of people in the major factor is that kids have poor and a poor upbringing uh, from their home background. Their parents are carers. These kids need help. Um, Andrea Chatton still with us. I think, Andrea, part of this, as you were saying there, is, is supporting parents because then once we support parents and give them everything they need and have the support that they require effectively what that does I would assume is then trickle down onto the children and then that becomes the sort of pattern of behaviour throughout the, the generations Absolutely and if we can get this right now that adult mental health services are well they're just not coping there are so many problems with mental health but, but if we look down tired a little bit and we look at the issues and start addressing those issues in childhood then we're going to save and do the prevention work, get this right for the kids, because if they're living in highly emotional, stressful, you know, situations where, you know, having a parent with a mental health problem and, and, and being worried about money can just activate mental health problems in any of us. Um, and those ACEs, those adverse child experiences, as I said, carry through. It could save us uh, having to address mental health issues across a person's lifetime, it's so important that we get this right for children because once their innocence goes, it goes. We can never get that back. And our job as a society and as parents is to try and preserve that innocence in our, innocence in our children. And once negative emotions are activated, the earlier they're activated, they gain momentum across the lifespan, which again is what leads into the mental health issues as an adult. Paul, just a final point from you. What what needs to happen? This isn't, I'm assuming, just about chucking money at the situation as much as that will help. But from your experiences and everything that you've shared with us this morning, what do you think can be done very quickly to, to assist these children who are living in need right now? Oh, Paul, are you still with us? Please shoot Oh, you're back with us. Sorry, Paul, we, we, we missed what you said there. Oh, sorry. I, well, in my opinion, the, the, the quickest way you could do it is just keep three meals to everyone. Just keep three meals to everyone. And uh, at primary school and secondary school, to remove that stigma. We've heard about the long-lasting effects. I've been homeless about 12, 13 times in my life. It does keep on happening. And so if you put the support in now, that will save money in the long term. You know what I mean? Because you get, all, as the lady just mentioned, you've got all the, the long-term effects, you know, with the having to work um, harder, you know, low-paid, you end, you end up in, I ended up in prison when I was 16 because of it as well. So the more you invest in children and the younger the age you invest in children, the, the, the better that will be in the long term for us, for the children and for society as well. So please feel milk straight away. Please, please, please if anyone from the Scottish Government's listening and remove prepayment meters as well. Thank you very much for your call this morning, Paul. That was Paul Stewart who was talking about his own experiences of growing up in poverty, talking about the work that he does with, with lots of different charities um, to try and, I suppose, share his experiences, but also uh, do a little bit to help. Um, Paul was talking there about the Scottish Government. Um, we did uh, see earlier on that they um, had given us a statement. The Scottish Government is committed to making Scotland the best place in the world to grow up and we will continue to place children and young people at the heart of decision making. Uh, it says a statement from them. Ministers are committed to implementing policies aimed at helping to reduce poverty in children and young people, including the game-changing Scottish child payment, free bus travel for under 22s, universal free school lunches to children in primaries, one to five and free higher and further education. Uh, they also go on to talk about, by the way, that UNCRC bill, which is a critical piece of legislation that will help respect, protect and fulfil children's rights. Uh, and ministers are determined to bring that bill back to Parliament. Uh,